The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar of today, Cities and Citizens, uh, New Solutions for the New Normal. Um, my name is Lisa Bock anderson um, I am the Director of Communications and Events at Ertico ITS Europe, and I am delighted to be your host today. Um, this webinar is a first in a series um, of eight webinars that uh, take us on a journey towards the ITS World Congress in Hamburg. Uh, you can see here on the slide that uh, the six topics of the Congress um, are covered by the webinars. Um, the dates are a little bit tentative for the moment, so they may change uh, a day or two, but the idea is to have a, a good cadence uh, until October. The aim, of course, is to uh, engage our stakeholders, engage you, and keep you informed. Talking about the Congress, here is just a, a few highlights. Um, we are preparing a fantastic program, and we look forward to seeing you there. Uh, we have three plenaries and, of course, also a number of executive sessions that go a little bit more in depth. We have, for the first time, two global forums, uh, one on Mars and one on port cities, of course, including Hamburg, our host city. Um, we will also have a um, ITS World Congress Summit that will host, amongst others, uh, around 25 ministers from around the world. Um, and you can see a couple of other points here uh, just to say that the program uh, is really looking very good indeed. Um, a couple of numbers. We were surprised and, of course, also happy to have uh, over 900 sessions and papers submitted by you. This is a little bit of a record, even in a uh, non-COVID time. Um, we also have a very good number of demonstrations and technical visits, as you can see here, 47 demos and 20 visits. Um, and last but not least, Hamburg is uh, preparing um, four tours around the area um, to showcase ITS highlights. Um, let me set the scene. Um, for today's webinar, where, by the way, we are uh, around 250 uh, people who have signed up. Um, it is indeed about new solutions for the new normal. Um, and it's not only a new normal in terms of COVID, uh, but we're really talking about sustainable solutions long term. And even though today sometimes sustainability and COVID are a little bit at odds, um, today is really about how we ensure cities that are accessible for all, cities that are affordable, that are well connected and that are safe. Um, and that is what we are going to discuss and hear about today. Um, just very few house rules. Everybody is in listening mode only. Um, we will, of course, uh, share the webinar with um, throughout our ERTICO communication channels. So for your information, the webinar will be recorded. Um, please do not hesitate to pose a question um, through the tool you can see. Um, questions, uh, the questions button. Um, we will have a Q&A at the end of the webinar, but please don't hesitate to pose your question as we move forward in the program. And speaking of program, uh, let me give a quick overview of the agenda. We have um, two keynotes. Um, Senator Charks, who is responsible for transport and mobility transition, 
in Hamburg, um, and Mr. Niels Schmidt from Siemens Mobility, who is a very important Congress partner for us, and who is the Vice President of Intelligent Traffic Management Systems. Um, after the two keynotes, we will take a deep dive into the program, um, and we have three great panelists uh, that will be presented a little bit later um, by the moderator for the panel, uh, Shelko, who is my great colleague, Deputy Director for Innovation and Deployment. Um, but first, I would like to give the word to Mr. Jakob Bangsgaard, who is the CEO of Ertico. Please, Jakob. Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, dear Senator Charks, dear Neil Smith, dear Ertico partners and colleagues, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are and a warm welcome also on my side, on behalf of, of the office. I do hope that we are now slowly, but surely on our way to putting an incredible tough year behind us. I'm sure that I speak on behalf of most of you when I say that our community is missing the togetherness and the networking that we used to have. On the positive side, we have been given this opportunity of a century to, to work together on creating a new normal for mobility and the mobility sphere for cities, for citizens, and for all other parts of our daily life where mobility plays such an important role. We are certainly looking forward with great optimism and enthusiasm for the ITS World Congress in Hamburg, and we have been doing our utmost to prepare a high quality event for which we know that the, the ITS community has been so much waiting for. I would like to thank all of those who have been part of this journey with us. By Thank you for submitting contributions for sessions, uh, being part of the exhibition and being part of the sponsorship. The energy that you bring is really the fuel that, that drives us. I also want to give a special thanks to the city of Hamburg, of course, and to our key partners like Siemens who are working with us to make Hamburg a true spectacular event. I really hope to meet you all very soon and I uh, hope to see you all in Hamburg. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jakob. Indeed, we look forward to meeting you all person in person. So let me now uh, hand over to Senator Charks. Please, Senator Charks, the floor is yours. Yeah, dear Lisa, dear Jakob, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen around the world, a warm welcome uh, from Hamburg as the host city of the ITS uh, World Congress in October 2021. Uh, and I hope I can not only uh, talk to you here on this camera and this microphone, but also see you in the end of the year in our beautiful city. Um, I'm Senator for Mobility and or for Traffic and Mobility Transition. So obviously, in, as in many cities around the world, mobility transition, the transition of the mobility from an automotive-centered uh, uh, policy and city in, uh, to a more sustainable mobility is uh, one of our key goals in our climate action plan and as well as in our uh, mobility strategy and as you can see here just some few glimpses of hamburg uh, on the right side our main boulevard which we uh, where we cut off cars last year and on the left side uh, germany's most uh, successful um, bicycle renting system and as a city we also build new subways uh, in the next years as one of the few european cities that is that is doing this and all in all we know even though the pandemic taps on our nerves we know that mobility will play a key role in shaping our cities and shaping the soul of our cities and uh, people will have uh, uh, the inherent need to move to travel commute to places to work to pleasure uh, to meet other people in real life, to sell goods, to negotiate in person, and uh, as you maybe look forward to traveling Hamburg during, uh, for the ITS World Congress, 
we all know that we need to reshape our mobility in the way it is sustainable and green. And for Hamburg, we are setting ambitious goals in this respect. Um, at the moment, we have uh, about 64% of uh, our mobility share is in a sustainable mode. We want to increase this by 14 percentage points uh, to 80% in 2030. And uh, obviously, like many other cities, we're going on the same way and uh, want to make our city more green, more healthier, more walkable, more bikeable, and uh, just better. Next slide, please. <clears throat> This is not the way my city looks at the moment. At the moment, it is uh, rather rainy. But what you can see here is uh, the sunset uh, shot from the police helicopter. And um, it is just uh, to give you a glimpse uh, that we are in largely industrial city, a city which uh, with a huge harbor and um, um, a city that is not only um, concerned with uh, walkability and bikeability, but also with all other kinds of uh, transport modes, such as fast train, heavy rail, autobahn, etc. Solutions for all of these uh, transport modes. And um, as we go on um, in uh, our city policy, um, we have like two kinds of uh, or let's say three main strings. The one is uh, we want to enhance digitalization and we want to uh, show you lots of demonstration. We have about 90 projects uh, running in Hamburg. Mr. Schmidt um, of Siemens will uh, introduce you to one of them, one of them next. And uh, we want to have uh, use the digitalization in many ways to make mobility more sustainable, greener, um, but also more safe. And uh, this uh, comes into place for all kinds of transport modes, but especially we want to enhance it in uh, the way of public transport, cars obviously as well, and um, the bikeability of the city uh, to give you a glimpse idea of what this means. Many cities enhanced bikeability in the last uh, year during the pandemic. Uh, we also built new bikeways, 62 kilometers last year, and we do not only want to do it within the pandemic, we want to do it every year, but it's not only about biking infrastructure, also there will be a crossing of, um, of uh, biking and digitalization, which is not so often, I guess, uh, but we want to use artificial intelligence uh, for a traffic light uh, forecasting system um, at all traffic lights in Hamburg. Um, for bikes. We can also have this for cars, but um, the car manufacturers have to do that themselves for the bikes. Obviously, there is no uh, companies doing this, therefore we're doing it for them. Next slide, please. Here, yeah, I want to give you a <coughs> short overview um, of um, the range and the branch um, of different topics and uh, um, uh, some projects. So we have obviously uh, projects concerning autonomous driving, um, but also uh, drones and moving data. Um, Mr. Schmidt is involved uh, in uh, traffic management uh, projects, but also we have uh, lots of projects in, uh, concerning public transport, uh, especially um, mobility as a service um, uh, data and uh, mobility apps. So to give you also, another quick example and to make a very short deep dive. Um, we all know that um, digitalization and intelligent transport system uh, can enhance uh, road safety. So um, obviously, uh, emergency call systems, intelligent speed adaption, turning assistance will reduce uh, the rate of uh, of severe incidents or deaths uh, in our road system. And obviously we share with many other countries and cities the Vision Zero. And uh, just to give you another small glimpse, therefore we build in as a city um, uh, turning assistance in every uh, truck we possess. So it's 870 and in every bus uh, we possess, uh, we'll do the same. Next slide, please. 
the main goals and fields of action during the Congress is, what I just said, increase uh, road safety. It's uh, one of the large projects and ideas of the ITS World Congress and a topic that is uh, uh, a topic around the world. <laughs> we obviously need to reduce traffic-related environmental impacts, especially want to need to fight climate change, but uh, also other um, environmental-related uh, impacts, and we need to do it on the big scale. Um, we need to increase reliability and efficiency of our um, uh, uh, travel system, especially in, in terms of uh, uh, the trains. We have uh, interesting projects uh, about the European train control system and how uh, the digitalization of the train system um, can work in a highly automatic way. We want to support good and secure information collection and distribution. I think that stands for itself, obviously, uh, like I think this is the, the key uh, message of ethical and the soul of ethical. We want to uh, promote uh, innovation um, like uh, ethical does all the time. So in the end of the day, next slide, please. Um, I just wanted to give you a very quick and short overview uh, of what you can see uh, in the city of Hamburg and uh, what you can see um, at the ITS World Congress. We have 90 projects, 47 demonstrations, uh, 20 technical visits, and hopefully we also expect many, many, many participants and not only on a digital level, but on a personal level, because in the end, uh, uh, the, the fun and the success of a Congress is that you can meet other people and connect with them. And I hope you can do this here in Hamburg and I welcome you uh, very much if you want to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dennis uh, and Jacques, for this very interesting introduction. Uh, we do indeed look forward to meeting in Hamburg uh, face to face. Um, now, thank you so much. Um, we turn to Mr. Niels Schmidt from Siemens Mobility. Um, Niels, please, the floor is, is yours. Well, Lisa, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, um, or as we say here in Germany, in Northern Germany, moin moin to everybody around the globe, and especially uh, Mr. Jacob Banska and uh, Senator Jax. Um, 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 again, a good afternoon to, to everybody here. Yeah, I can tell you I'm, I'm very excited about the upcoming ITS World Congress uh, and uh, having the chance to meet again here in person in Hamburg, and of course, still safe under the rules and restriction of COVID-19, but I hope that uh, we are going to overcome this until um, October, and I'm pretty sure. Uh, Attico is for us a great professional and um, highly appreciated partner organizing this Congress as uh, they call it, largest event on intelligent transport and services. But I must say, reflecting Singapore and Montreal, we discover one important thing that makes this upcoming event the best ever seen. Our most beautiful town and fantastic whole city of Hamburg, of course. Yeah. And as just heard from Mr. Tjax, um, Hamburg uh, belongs to a little number of cities being leader in traffic transformation. And we as Siemens Mobility, Mobility are proud to present our solution on further mobility on this year's ITS World Congress. Many of you might have heard already that we, as the intelligent traffic part of Siemens Mobility, will be an independent company starting this summer. So you will already find us with our new name, Unix Traffic. So also for us, the future starts now. Next uh, slide, please. So now is the time to take action on uh, future mobility. Oh, you can uh, go to the next slide uh, already. Thank you very much. Uh, if you now, uh, if it's now it's time to take action on future mobility, two pillars are essential from our perspective. And starting with a quote from Bill Gates, we only have to remember two figures. The one is 37 billion and the second one is zero. 
37 billion tons is the actual amount, or 2007 was the actual amount of CO2 emission every year, with a contribution of 6.7 billion from road traffic. And zero is the amount we can bear. Creating a mobility environment for all must have the ambition to make cities more livable. By defining the right framework that qualifies in reduction of CO2 emission, developing the right mobility mix, and helps people to enjoy urban mobility. And to make it simple and clear, 1.5 million kilometers of traffic jam only in Germany every year does not paying in of any of these targets. And secondly, on a global basis, we have to bewail from COVID-19 crisis, 3 million fatalities over the last 12 months. But compared, we still are facing also roughly 1.4 million fatalities from traffic accidents every year. So how can we do things different? And Hamburg is a great example from my perspective. Strong players like Hamburg Authority of Transport and Mobility Transition, Hamburger Hochbahn, Hamburg Port Authority or LSBG and Hamburger Verkehrsanlagen working hand in hand to make a difference. Strengthening public transport, piloting autonomous buses, supporting first and last mile, being a leader in traffic management and combining, as we say, old traffic modes with new solutions like integrated and shared mobility or giving bikes more often priority shows. Hamburg is on its way to a future mobility. Next slide, please. And we are proud to support Hamburg on its way with innovative projects on the edge to a mobility that is moving beyond. On, its, uh, on ITS World Congress, we'd like to share more insights about a next level of future mobility. For instance, making bike, uh, bikes quicker and safer with our bike solutions to guide and form and prioritize cyclists, or bridging trenches between different mobility modes with an integrated mobility management um, as our joint project with Hamburg Tins. And we're happy to give you, as we say, a ride with the first autonomous and connected heat bus at Hafen City. And much more to show, urban and interurban solutions from cities like London, Singapore, Wiesbaden, and many others. A stronger digitalization with usage of artificial intelligence makes traffic safer and quicker and manage traffic more environmental friendly. Giving CO2 emission a price tag or shifting individual traffic towards fleets will help to make cities much more livable for citizens with less emission and less fatalities. And that's our ambition. So, Coming back to the excitement, see you at ITS World Congress. Don't miss us on our booth at B5201 and see you as Unix traffic on ITS World Congress. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. I very much enjoyed the Can last- see it again, B5201. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, both of you, um, for setting the scene. Uh, it's very interesting to see how you really have the focus on cities and how you integrate innovative solutions and really make it more livable for the, 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 the people and the citizens uh, who, you know, transport themselves uh, and their goods every day. Now, let's move to our second part of the webinar. Um, which, as I said before, is really a, a bit more of a deep dive uh, into the topics. Um, I now uh, give uh, the word to my colleague, Shelko. Uh, please, Shelko. Uh, thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, good morning, good, good day, and good afternoon, good evening, like uh, Jakob said to all of you. Greetings from not so sunny Brussels uh, today. Um, all of the technologies that we are going to be showcasing at the ITS World Congress in Hamburg are here for a purpose. We as a society are facing some tremendous challenges uh, ahead of us. The, we all know the climate change. L just last week, we had the three major announcements from e EU, from UK and from the United States that are potentially going to reshape the mobility in the coming nine years and, and going ahead of us. 
Um, a lot of countries uh, are going towards 50% reduction of CO2 emissions uh, within 10 years, which is tremendous, tremendous. At the same time, you also have other societal challenges, such as road safety. We also have a number of countries worldwide that are aiming at Vision Zero. We need to cut out fatalities from the, from the transport and mobility. At the same time, we also need to remember why do we have transport and mobility. Transport and mobility is basically the, the bloodstream and, and the uh, key essence of our entire society to provide more equity, to provide more possibilities for jobs, to provide more opportunities uh, basically for all of us. So today in the afternoon, we are going to have now three fantastic speakers who are going to give us some of the insights uh, of where are we heading in the future with the transport solutions. We are also going to look into what are the solutions already today that are applicable in different uh, parts of the world. So right now we are going to jump three continents basically in the coming from the coming three, three speakers. We are going to start here in Europe talking a little bit about connected and automated vehicles. We are going to jump to uh, African continent and developing countries where we are going to look into electromobility and how electromobility not only can be good for the air quality and the climate change, but actually can be a very good from the business model point of view as well. And finally, last but not least, we're also going to hear ex extremely ex uh, exciting examples from what our colleagues from the United States are doing uh, on mobility. And of course, increasing the equity and accessibility for all of their citizens to fair transport. That said, I would not like to take much more time from these exciting speakers. I would like to invite the first speaker, which is Dr. Henriette Cornet. Uh, she is a senior uh, manager at International Association of Public Transport. Henriette, can you please tell us about your work uh, that you're doing on connected and automated vehicles, please? Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you very much, Jaco, for this uh, kind uh, introduction. So my name is uh, Henriette Cornet uh, from uh, UITP, which is the international association of uh, public transport and i will jump directly telling you more about uh, my topic which is about i want to present you a perspective of a, a project a big project that we are working on in the field of connected cooperative and automated mobility what we call a uh, sicam uh, most of the time and it's it's referring to the driverless shuttles robot taxi or buses that you can see on the picture for example and our stance by UITP, so that's why I insist uh, on that, I like to insist on that because we are the Association of Public Transport, is that benefits of SICAM, if we speak, for example, of uh, the, to, to have less congestion, to have less emissions, uh, can only be, be achieved, these benefits can only be achieved if SICAM is deployed as shared mobility. So we don't believe at UITP that individual vehicles uh, like AVs uh, should be used as individual vehicles, but really as shared mobility to reach the full benefit of it. We are involved, UITP is involved in many uh, discussions around SECAM with the Commission and also through uh, projects. And today, so next slide, please. I want to give you really a, a, to make a, a spotlight on a very large project, uh, the show project, uh, which I am co uh, coordinating personally. And uh, this is about deploying shared, connected and electrified fleets of automated vehicles. And really in the context, as they could say, really important of this sustainable uh, urban mobility that we want to achieve. I put on the slide some targets. Uh, it's just a selection. We have many because it's a very, very large project. I would say more in, in a bit. Uh, so I just selected some of these uh, KPIs that we have in the project. For example, we want to reach 90% reduction of uh, CO2 at city level and also 30% reduction of the noise. This is to be achieved partly because the vehicle will be electric, electrified, but also because we hope that people will also shift to, to, to use more shared mobility than before. We hope to increase also the, the our goal in the project is to increase the person kilometer traveled for a group, specific groups of citizens, so the elderly, the person with reduced mobility, and children. That's something we, we look at as well. And in general, we want to improve the quality of service. So what you can see, our stance in show project is really user-centered, human-centered even, uh, and looking at uh, how to improve uh, the quality of life in the city. Um, you can go to the next slide. 
you can see here i put some figures because i will uh, I, I don't want to stay too long on this on this uh, incredible project i say this because you can see what's very unique in the project is the size of the consortium we have 69 consortium members and uh, the project is running for four years and stay tuned keep updated about uh, stay updated about the project because next year we will deploy our vehicle on uh, real life so real life really on road in the cities that you can see on the on the right side of the of the slide so all over europe and uh, there will be uh, all in all 70 vehicles and the same i present before so having robot taxi versus shutters for persons but also for goods that's something uh, that we want to tackle also in the project meaning that we want to see if these shuttles that will be deployed can also be used for example for delivery next slide please um, my, it's, it's, it's a finite slide, actually. I just want to say a word about citizens' expectations. Since our, since our webinar today is really much about cities and citizens, um, I wanted to spotlight something specific in the project, because before I start with this slide, uh, please know that in the project there will be many technical development, business models development, and so on. If you want more information on it, you will have to go to the website or to contact me. Don't hesitate. I'm, uh, you can find me over the website without problem. And, uh, but here I'm focusing really much on our user engagement uh, within the project. And we organized beginning of the year um, a so-called ideathon, so meaning it's a workshop with end users, so the, the people that we are targeting or association representing uh, the users. Um, we gathered together uh, 39 participants. And throughout the day, uh, there was many ideas uh, proposed. And I selected three for, for you today from these uh, great ideas that have been proposed. And I want to, uh, to spotlight particularly one. And um, so beyond the, the two first ones that you can see having um, something to explain how the service works, because maybe not uh, all the future users are familiar with AVs. We, uh, there is also this uh, importance of having more accessibility uh, to the service, and especially for the person with reduced mobility, so for example, in form of audiovisual mes uh, messaging or a way to get specific assistance to use the service uh, across the whole trajectory. The last point, what I wanted to highlight also because this delivery of goods is, is quite interesting to, to, to look at, the people proposed to have pickup points for parcels in the neighborhoods, although our suggestion was to, was to have door-to-door -door delivery, uh, the, our participants put the emphasis on how, how great it would be to have the AVs parked somewhere uh, on the... So in Europe, what we have uh, at many cities is a church or a marketplace, and there there could be, for example, the AVs park at the same time of uh, uh, every day, of the, like a one day uh, in the week, and people will gather there. So it will help to have a bit more of active mobility for the people to move there and some social contact, and this was particularly emphasized in the time of COVID, where we are all at home, okay, we get our delivery parcel, but it's a bit frustrating not meeting everyone. So this could be something also social. And I think this example show very well that the, the citizens, the users, need to be integrated in such project because they come, they come with new ID. And they are not always looking for the greatest efficiency or comfort, but also with things like a social interaction and so on. And that's why we were very happy to, to of the results of this idea then. And the next step will be to have uh, to have this idea more co concretized through an hackathon um, that will be uh, that will be organized with developers, experts uh, to make this more concrete. And it will be organized during the ITS World Congress. So the the loop is closed. Uh, back to the ITS World Congress, where we will be happy to meet you because show the show project will be there. We will be present. And we'll be glad to meet you and to exchange more on this project. And the last slide is just a few. Um, if you go to next slide, to the last one, you will just see a few uh, way to connect with us. For example, with the with the website or through the through LinkedIn and Twitter. And don't hesitate to follow us uh, through the uh, through the newsletter as well. Thanks. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Henriette. Uh, we, we are collaborating from Ertico side uh, with UITP and we have, we have very uh, good collaboration. We are very pleased because it's a really groundbreaking project. We, 
I don't think we have seen any project with 70 self-driving vehicles. And, and, and I think we sometimes when we are sitting uh, late at nine, at night at working at different activities in this project, we are thinking, have we been insanely ambitious? But, but I think the, the outcomes are going to be just fantastic. So thank you very much. I agree. Thank you for your time. Thank and please you. stay with us because we are also going to have uh, questions and answers uh, after this uh, round of speakers. Now, I would just like to remind everybody in the audience as well, please use the questions of, um, opportunity uh, to, to, uh, to ask questions. On your right side uh, in the GoToMeeting, you will have opportunity to type in your questions. We are going to take, try to take as many uh, questions as possible uh, at the end at the Q&A session. Now, I'm very pleased also to welcome Alexander Kerner, uh, who is coming from the United Nations Environmental Program. Uh, we all know that, of course, when it comes to uh, climate uh, crisis, when it comes to air quality, when it comes to uh, social aspects, uh, we cannot compare ourselves, we cannot compare all of the regions equally, so to say. Uh, we are all in some ways facing similar challenges, but we also need to look at different solutions. So it is very much encouraging to see how, um, for example, developing countries such as Africa uh, are addressing some of these uh, topics. And here I'm also very pleased to uh, welcome Alexander, who we are collaborating together in the Solutions Plus project, to please tell us a little bit about your experiences of what is happening on the African continent and especially on, from the point of electromobility. Alexander, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jalko, for the introduction. Um, my name is Alex Kerner. I'm a program officer at the United Nations Environment Program, um, sitting in Nairobi. The program is headquartered in Nairobi. Um, we are, I'm part of the Sustainable Mobility Unit, and our unit is basically uh, dealing with all sorts of transport issues, covering non-motorized transport, um, covering issues of energy efficiency and fuel quality, but then also more recently covering um, electric mobility. Um, just a few numbers, yeah. Uh, so by now we have about a billion uh, uh, vehicles on the road, a billion light duty vehicles on the road. Projections um, see that doubling or more than doubling to two, 2.5 billion vehicles by 2050. Now most of this growth is actually um, taking place in non-OECD countries, yeah. And it's very important to remind ourselves that by 2050, it's very likely that three out of five cars will be found in. Uh, non-OECD countries, which is why um, looking in uh, looking at uh, low and middle income countries, including them in the effort to uh, to, to fight climate change, is actually uh, really a must. Um, without them, we will not reach any uh, climate targets, for example, settled under the uh, Paris Agreement. Um, so I will uh, deep a little bit. Uh, I will dive a little bit deeper into um, our UNEP electric mobility program. I'm the coordinator of that program. Um, <clears throat> so that program now covers more than 40 e-mobility projects worldwide. Eh? They are not only in Africa, um, we are having projects in Southeast Asia, in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, we are having projects in Latin America. Um, now these projects, they are all uh, targeting a similar, uh, a similar sort of uh, uh, interventions. Eh? On the one side, uh, a lot of technical assistance, looking at capacity building and um, developing of policies to incentivize electric mobility, um, developing of finance schemes uh, together with banks, together with uh, uh, investors, um, developing of business models to actually bring electric mobility in low and middle income countries. When I'm talking about electric mobility, we are not really not so much thinking about the individual car. Eh? We are much more looking at fleet operations fleet operations in the sense of buses in public transport systems, uh, uh, two and three wheelers in as taxis, eh? vans and, and light duty vehicles for last mile delivery. That is really the sort of electric mobility we are targeting. And that sort of electric mobility is very much adapted to uh, the, the, the prerequisites we find in many uh, low and middle income countries. I'm happy to say that we are working together with Ertico, we are working together with UITP, um, on a project which is part of the or which contributes to uh, to the UNEP e-mobility uh, pro program, which is the Solutions Plus project demonstrating electric vehicles, electric uh, uh, vehicle solutions in nine cities around the world. Um, <clears throat> 
the entire aim of the UNEP electric mobility program is really to demonstrate uh, uh, viability of electric mobility solutions on the ground and to bring together all the all the stakeholders which are necessary to to create new and bigger projects eh? bringing together possible projects in countries in cities with finance be that uh, development banks be that private investors um, and the actual uh, e-mobility industry eh? the bus manufacturers the electric motorcycle manufacturers the uh, tuk-tuk manufacturers, all those uh, companies are very much invited to participate, to participate in the project, in the program, and to also see that there are other markets for electric two and three wheelers um, apart from Asia. And now that's I'm I'm, I'm going to focus a little bit more on uh, 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 on uh, the African two and three wheeler market and uh, the African applica or uh, application for electric two and three wheelers in uh, this next slide, please. Um, what we see here the providers um, I'm talking about uber like uh, systems whereby you uh, can basically order a taxi order a trip um, uh, uh, select uh, select your route uh, pay with mobile money and I have to say yes it is about leapfrogging eh? I'm based in Kenya Kenya has uh, a mobile money system which is called M-Pesa and this is really basically covering 99% of the population. Yeah, everybody who has a mobile phone has mobile money. That is a very, very, very big dis uh, advantage and that's actually something you don't find that easily in uh, developed parts of the world. Yeah? Now, uh, linking mobile money with uh, mobility uh, services is a, a very, uh, very, very, uh, 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 very nice uh, way of uh, getting intelligent transport systems working yeah and what we see all over sub-saharan africa that there is a huge interest in electric mobility because what they realize is that total operation costs over the lifetime of such a motorcycle total cost of ownership might be much lower than the actual uh, uh, costs for a conventional vehicle yeah and it's not only about mobility as a service it's about um manufacturing it's about assembling or even retrofitting um, these sort of vehicles within um, countries here. It is about bringing online innovative charging solutions, including battery swapping, including uh, schemes for uh, integration of renewable power generation. Yeah? There's a lot of things going on, and a lot of this has to do with innovative business models um, and has to do, has to do with uh, 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 digital money, for example. Yeah? Um, next slide, please. Okay, so now that slide uh, it might look a bit scary to you. It's actually an old one. I had submitted a, a newer one. But anyway, um, I'm not going uh, through all these numbers, but sometimes numbers are really, really interesting, especially if you look at them at home, if you have a, 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 a quiet moment. What I'm just trying to tell you here is that if you um, compare uh, fixed cost and operational costs of electric motorcycles, um, used as taxis and if you compare them to conventional motorcycles then you see that there's actually a very very viable value proposition there yeah? now <clears throat> thing is many uh, motorcycles used as taxis um, are used very intensively uh, going 100 kilometers and more per day on the other side they are based on very very old technology yeah carburetor engines almost four liters of uh, gasoline per 100 kilometers yeah now, that is really the point. If you go through these numbers, the energy savings are so substantial. Eh? While uh, with a, a normal motorcycle, you would almost spend 5,000 and more dollars uh, for fuel over, let's say, five years. Uh, are very conservative. Yeah? If you go to incremental costs, $2,200 more for an electric bicycle, uh, motorcycle compared to
inspired you a little bit on uh, 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 e-mobility applications in other parts of the world. And thanks for being invited here. Thanks for having a chance speaking to you. Thank you. Alex, excellent presentation, really insightful and also exciting to, to see the examples uh, from, from uh, African continent. I remember already 10 years ago looking at the uh, mobile uh, payments with the uh, M-Pesa uh, payments that were originating in Africa. Fantastic innovation um, uh, on, from the coming from the continent. And now we see also electromobility uh, being driven from there. But not also only there. I mean, it was fantastic to learn also about Kathmandu's electrification uh, movements already from the middle of 90s. Uh, and we see this all over the world. So, Alex, we look forward to discussing this much more at the uh, ITS World Congress in Hamburg, where electromobility is going to be one of the key themes, and we are going to look at examples from all over the uh, world. So stay with us. We are still going to have some questions for you, um, hopefully from the audience as well. And I would like to invite now the, the speaker that is going to represent the United States, uh, where we are going to have an example of sustainable urban transport. We have with us to we have a pleasure with us to have um, to have with us Leslie Richards, uh, who is general manager for Southeastern Pennsylvania Transport Authority (SEPTA). She's going to tell us a little bit about the very important aspect, and that is already today in the transit community we have a lot of solutions that can help us to uh, achieve all of our societal targets, uh, be it road safety, be it decarbonization. But what is very important for us to reap these benefits is actually that we have affordability, accessibility, and equity in the transport. So Leslie, very warm welcome to you as well. Thank you for being with us this early morning for yourself. And please tell us about your work. Sure, thank you. Uh, yes, it is a rainy morning here in Philadelphia, uh, but very happy uh, to be with all of you here today. Uh, please show my first slide as I start to um, let people know what's happening uh, here in southeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, we've talked about climate change. We've talked about sustainability. I'd like to talk about those things as well as equity, accessibility, affordability. Uh, but I'd like to start off with saying how we here um, at SEPTA, uh, which is the Southeastern uh, Pennsylvania Transportation Authority. We are the sixth largest transit agency here in the United States. And we have always been committed uh, to sustainability and uh, we're doing um, uh, some interesting things. I will say in more than our 50 year history here, we've also never faced a more critical moment where we have pressing financial, social and environmental issues here. Um, as has been mentioned before, um, while we have missed uh, networking with each other, we do also uh, recognize that this is a once in a generation opportunity for us um, to figure out a way uh, to be more sustainable, more accessible, more equitable uh, in everything that we do. And we know that as cities recover, when we focus on reducing congestion and improving our environment, um, we know that that will lead to the best recovery. Uh, so just wanted to emphasize um, how we store energy. We take the friction from our rails and we store energy for later use. We also uh, have committed to getting 20% uh, of all of our energy from um, solar uh, and we have invested in solar farms uh, throughout um, the, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and also just to remind everybody that three of our modes are completely um 100 clean with zero emissions and that's our rail our subways and our trolleys and we will continue uh, to make these investments uh, next slide please as i mentioned uh covid19 uh has hit us hard as all transit agencies and but it's also demonstrated that transit is an essential service we help get people to health care groceries essential goods as well as getting the workers needed uh, for those uh, life-sustaining uh, essential uh, work that needs to be done. Uh, we are enhancing our cleaning. Uh, we're making sure that our air is refreshing every two and a half minutes on average in all of our platforms and all of our vehicles, making sure people feel safe on transit and transit um, is one of the least risky um, activities uh, right now. But we're also 
looking at partnerships here, you see how we've partnered with the Black Doctors COVID-19 Consortium, making sure that testing and vaccine in our poorest neighborhoods um, are available. Uh, we've helped get uh, the National Guard to help uh, get vaccines out to others, and we've helped transport them as well as providing transportation to vaccines uh, and making sure anyone who needs help, paratransit, anyone with uh, disabilities can get uh, to where they need. Uh, I also just want to mention uh, some challenges we're having with those experiencing homelessness, mental illness, as well as drug addiction. And uh, we want to be compassionate as we deal with these issues, making sure that our system is safe for our employees uh, and our customers, and also making sure that we can do as much as we can uh, to make sure um, these individuals uh, get treatment and transitional housing and permanent housing um, connections as well. Uh, next slide, please. Here, um, we uh, put forth, I'm very proud with our board voting um, during the pandemic uh, to go ahead with a fair equity uh, structure. And uh, we have free transfers for the first time ever here to, so people can use our system. Uh, that top uh, example there on the right shows how um, a customer in one of our poorest served neighborhoods um, before this uh, restructuring would take uh, 44 minutes to get from their neighborhood to a job located in the center of Philadelphia. And now with the free transfer, that person is saving over 20 minutes uh, each way, uh, being able to take a bus and then get onto our subway, which is a, a fast and efficient way. Um, the time is always valuable, but particularly to people who live close to the poverty line here and pretty important uh, in, in uh, delivering more accessible and equitable um, service. Uh, we've also seen through travel surveys that our riders during the pandemic are more likely to be female, to be people of color, to be lower income, and also um, to uh, be less likely to own a car. And the reason behind that is because um, many of them cannot afford a car. And so uh, we've been very um, focused, again, on making sure that all of our decisions moving forward have that equitable component to make sure that people can access opportunity and use our system um, for that. We're also taking a look at how we deliver our service. Uh, typically, it would be around commuter peak times in the morning and in the afternoon, late afternoon. And now we're looking at more of a lifestyle service so that people can get to where they need to be at all times of the day and also making sure uh, that that's accessible. It's easier for people with strollers and as well as people uh, in wheelchairs and canes and have other uh, mobility challenges. And uh, we just wanna make sure again that uh, people can get to the drugstore to get their prescriptions filled, can get to the supermarket to get their food, um, can get to uh, make sure that their children are where they need to be, they can care for their family as well. And so uh, again, making sure that all of our decisions moving forward um, take those measures into account. And then my last slide that I wanna share with you today is what we're doing uh, to make sure, next slide please, uh, to make sure that um, everything that we do um, not only is equitable and accessible and helping um, uh, be fair, uh, but we also want to help this area recover. And we wanna make sure that we accelerate a strong recovery here in greater Philadelphia and throughout the entire Commonwealth. And so uh, we're, using, <clears throat> we're using technology to build a 21st century transportation network. Mobility as a service has been mentioned, our apps we're taking a look at. Uh, we have initiatives such as um, uh, looking at a complete bus redesign called Bus Revolution right now. Where do people need, when do they need to be there? And that gets back to our lifestyle service as well that I mentioned. It's a holistic rethinking uh, of our network as well as a tro trolley modernization program which serves some of our poorest neighborhoods and again, gives them access to opportunity. Uh, we did public hearings uh, during the pandemic, we'll continue to do so. And again, in that equity lens, it allowed us uh, to provide that information on our budgets and on our fares um, in more languages than ever, uh, fully in Spanish, fully in Mandarin, um, as well as other opportunities to engage um, our, our multicultural um, and uh, multi-language speaking uh, residents. Uh, so with that, we know that 2021 is a critical year. And as we all know, transportation is not a cost, but an investment. 
and is going to lead uh, toward a more equitable future for all of us. So thanks so much for having me, and I look forward to the questions and answers. Thank you very much, Leslie. A fantastic presentation. And uh, now we have gone around the world. Uh, basically, we've gone through three different continents. In the future, we're also going to have the other continents with us. Uh, we have also gone from the innovation and looking into the future with autonomous vehicles to, let's say, innov latest innovation today with electrification. But we also looked into the transport reality uh, of today in, in the US uh, and what, what is being done there. Now, before we go to the questions and answer session, I would just like to use a couple of uh, minutes to, to give you a little bit of insight of what we are doing from the uh, Ertico side uh, when it comes to understanding the reality of the city. This is an initiative that we call City Moonshot, and we are doing this together with our partners. So all, all of the industrial partners, all of the public authorities that we have in our membership, but we're also working very closely with our colleagues from, for example, ITS Canada, ITS America, um, many, many other collaboration partners. I will not uh, try even try to mention them all. So if we can just go to the next slide, please. Um, I would just like to show you a map uh, of that represents approximately 80 cities uh, in Europe, uh, which we have interviewed up to today uh, on the topics of sustainability. We are speaking with cities, how do they see uh, air pollution and climate emergency? Uh, we are also speaking with the cities on data sharing between how do they see the data sharing between the city authorities uh, and also with private stakeholders. So, for example, what kind of data is city collecting and willing to share with other stakeholders and under what conditions? Uh, and also what kind of data would city authorities like to receive from, for example, everybody like Ubers or, or bus companies or taxi companies? fleet management providers, etc. And the third topic is mobility as a service, uh, as we refer to it in Europe. In Northern America, it's usually referred to mobility on demand. Uh, here we are looking into how our city is thinking about this new mobility concept. Um, do they have prerequisites for this? Um, what, what are the business models behind it, etc. In total, we have 58 questions that we are that we are using as our interview uh, with all of the city representatives. Typically, these are directors or heads of transport mobility in the different city authorities. In total, we aim to interview 300 cities worldwide, uh, 200 in Europe, and 100 uh, cities in other parts of the of the world. And I can just mention to you, uh, for example, that yesterday we had the interview with uh, Helsinki. Uh, in the coming week, we are going to have interviews with Los Angeles, New York, and New, York, New Orleans. Uh, but also, we are having interviews with cities like Yekaterinburg or Yuzhno, uh, Yuzhno Nagorny, I believe. Um, so it's both big and small cities. We really need to understand the reality. How do cities think about mobility? What we also see is what is interesting is that very often these these three topics are done by three different transport department, uh, three different departments. You have environmental department in the city, you have a traffic management department in the city, and you have public transport uh, department in the city. So I will just give you a headlight of three examples of our outcomes or findings. If you go to the next slide. Uh, we are going to find, uh, present all of the findings in the big report that is going to be launched at the ITS World Congress in Stockholm. <laughs> Hamburg, ITS World Congress in Hamburg, apologies for mentioning my hometown. Uh, the first example of the cities is that, uh, is that we see that approximately 44% uh, of the cities have already or are planning to announce climate emergency. And these are the preliminary findings that are telling us that when cities are looking into the sustainability, then they see immediately, <clears throat> for example, bicycle lanes, they're looking at e-charging infrastructure, they're looking into public transport, uh, as an example, and of course, development of transport action plans that is binding all of this. So these are the four uh, most relevant actions to address these air quality uh, and climate change topics. If you go to next slide, please. <clears throat> We are also talking about data sharing. So we, have, we are gaining a lot of information about data uh, that cities are collecting, what 
uh, what standards they are using, what are the conditions that cities would like to uh, share this data with, with us. Uh, and we see that vast majority of the cities is willing uh, to share data with other stakeholders. Um, in vast majority of the cases, this data is also shared for free because the cities are saying, well, we are public authority, all of the data and everything that we own is a public good. So it would not be right to charge for that data. And in those cases when they say that that would be for a cost, that is only in the cases where they need to collect new data. And all, all of this is valid um, for data this is, that is already existing by the cities. So typically you don't ask them to collect new data for you. They, they cannot guarantee quality of the data or they cannot do further processing of data on behalf of one stakeholder. Um, and they provide you basically that data without any warranty, so to say. So the cities are very much open to share their data with us. Uh, they, many of them are also going to uh, providing open data portals. And what is also very interesting, the most interesting question uh, that uh, when we ask cities what kind of data would you like to receive from private entities, they would like to have origin destination data to understand better the transport and traffic flows of their citizens in the cities. Next question, please, or next slide, is an example of data that we are getting from mobility as a service or mobility and demand. And here we're asking questions uh, from the cities about if they have preconditions for mobility as a service. So integrated uh, ticketing system, uh, as an example, or accessibility to citizens, uh, to a wide range of um, um, different transport modes. Here, we need to be a little bit careful with the results. I just want to show this as an example, but these results are still biased because when we started interviewing the first cities and we have interviewed up to now approximately 120 cities, uh, most of the cities that we started with were the bigger ones. Now we are continuing, of course, to interview bigger cities around the world, but we're also going much more into medium and smaller cities. And when we go to small cities, we don't expect that many of them are going to have integrated ticketing system, as an example. So much more on this, we are going to be revealing at the ITS uh, World Congress in Hamburg. There's going to be a report, there are going to be two uh, major forums and sessions with much more discussion about how do the cities and city authorities see transport and mobility uh, in the context of sustainability, data sharing and mobility as a service. And next slide, please. So this would be a short just introduction and a small teaser as well to what we are doing as a preparations and ramping up to the ITS World Congress in Hamburg. We are now coming into questions and answer uh, session, which we are going to jo do jointly between Lisa and myself. Lisa, would you like to see the first question that we may have from the colleagues uh, in the audience? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Shelker, and thank you also for the panelists' presentations. Very, very interesting. Um, we have a first question here for Nils uh, Schmidt from Siemens Mobility, and that is around the project you mentioned uh, on connected and automated driving, the heat. Um, the question is how uh, is Siemens involved here and also if you could talk a little bit about how this project differentiates itself um, from other uh, projects on autonomous driving. Please Niels, the floor is yours. Um, yeah, thanks for the question, Lisa. Um, uh, it's uh, one of our anchor projects. I love it very much. Uh, um, it's very innovative. And uh, um, it's, uh, we are um, um, involved in that project uh, due to um, a higher safety uh, for autonomous buses. We have a, a multi-layer of uh, security. We are um, uh, combining the, the, the security layers uh, or safety layers from the bus with the uh, uh, detections uh, from, from the street and the intelligent infrastructure that we, are, have, we, are, that we have around combining this to a, a kind of, of, of network. And this gives the Hamburger Hofbahn the, the information for the bus, uh, also integrated in the control center to uh, the, get this bus safe through, through the city. 
And uh, what you will see when we're going to see us um, on our fantastic ITS World Congress in Hamburg is that this bus is really going through the city. It's down in Hafen City. There's a lot of traffic, a lot of people walking around. You have bicycles and logistics, uh, uh, whatever is around. And this bus is going safely around our parkour there, and it's working well. And uh, um, uh, from that perspective, and the third layer is, is, is um, that this bus should go faster than others. So we're seeing a lot of buses that is going with 10 or 15 kilometers per hour uh, through the cities. But if we really uh, 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 want, want to put this into life and want to use this for the last mile, then this bus should go faster. We don't see that all the time in the, in the, in the city, of course not. But uh, therefore, it's important because, if I, for instance, I'm thinking about, um, I grew up in a very little small town outside of a, another little city in, in, in northern Germany. And the bus was only, only coming three times a day. It was much too expensive. It was difficult to, get, to, to, to close this connection. And it was, would be ideal to let this bus run and uh, uh, pick up uh, passengers there. So um, this is one, this is, this is at least that what we're doing in Heat in Hamburg. And it's uh, very well connected also um, uh, to, to that what uh, Henriette Cornette said. We're also a member of um, uh, her initiative. So um, hope to, uh, she will, will, be, will join us in Hamburg when we're going to see us there in October. Excellent. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, Niels. And continuing on that, I, I actually had, I see there's one question for Henriette, um, considering the show. So Henriette, if you can join us, please. Uh, we saw just right now from Leslie in the US that uh, accessibility is a key part to transport. So how do we ensure with these latest technologies, with vehicle automation and, and shared mobility, et cetera, how do we make sure that we don't leave anybody behind, any potential future user? Yes, it's, uh, thanks, uh, thanks very much uh, for the question. That's a challenge, and I would say, especially now in the COVID time, is the challenge because you can think of accessibility in terms of physical accessibility to the service, and this public transportation has always worked to this so that people have good access to public transport. Uh, so it means it's not too far away from their home, the first, uh, the first uh, transport, uh, public transport access. It can also mean accessibility in form of uh, getting into the vehicle, for example, if you're a wheelchair user, but something I want to point out in this context is the, for example, how, how confident, how agile are people, our citizens with technology. And this is something, if you, if you address only people that, are, that, can, that have a smartphone, that have access to internet, and so they can book a ride with an AV through the smartphone, you will leave behind the ones that are not a technology uh, tech savvy, so to say, the, the tech savvy uh, person. And this is something we have to take care about. And it's a challenge because uh, now we are doing all virtual events, questionnaire uh, through internet and so on. So we have to pay attention. Fortunately, within the project starting next year when we will deploy the vehicle on the road, we will really have ecosystems into place. And these ecosystems involving the city, involving the local partners, will be able to reach the people really on the ground and be sure that no one is, is left behind. But it needs to be real. It needs to be like a physical. Otherwise, there is a risk to, to, to forget some people. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much, Henriette. Really interesting. And, and we are looking forward to discussing this much more at, uh, at the Con uh, World Congress in Hamburg. Uh, I'm just going through the other questions. And I have a one very interesting question for uh, Leslie, uh, if you can please join us. And basically, the question is that last week we saw the big announcement from the America, from the U.S. administration uh, about the Build Back Better plan, where you are going to have quite significant investments in decarbonization. But it's not only about decarbonization; it's also about building new society. Basically, um, do you see this as an opportunity for yourself to boost the operations of your transport uh, agency and and intelligent mobility uh, in in, in your uh, region. Hold on one second. Can you hear me here? Yes. Um, I think I was fighting with the organizer. I kept on mute, uh, trying to unmute, and she would unmute. And anyway, um, 
Yeah, no, we're really thrilled right now um, with the direction coming out of DC, out of our uh, presidential administration. In fact, last night, uh, President Biden uh, reinforced his commitment to, uh, to build back better, where um, equity, the environment, and the economy are um, the, the, the strong backbone of, of that message. And of course, all of those things um, are inherent in uh, transit. And uh, so we're really thrilled. All of the um, options right now um, that have been put forth uh, by Congress have a large transit component. Uh, I think we have seen during the pandemic, not just here in Pennsylvania, not just here in the United States, but globally how important transit is to getting essential workers to where they need to be, to getting everyone uh, to, to where they need to be, to allow them to function as safely as possible during this extremely challenging time. And uh, so again, it is seen as an investment and, and not a cost here. And uh, we can help the economy while also uh, making sure um, that uh, we move forward in an equitable way and that we do so in a sustainable way now. And uh, now, now is the time to do that uh, because in a few years it is gonna be really, really hard if not impossible to catch up. Thank you very much. I'm looking at the time and um, I think I'm looking at the questions as well. There is uh, one question here um, for Alexander, if you could join us. Um, it is about uh, all these great mobility solutions that you were mentioning. Um, and the question is about long term sustainability. What will happen post funding? Uh, I think um, really what we need to do now is creating confidence in the technology and making sure that the right products are um, in the right regions. Eh? It is not just about taking a product which might work, for example, in Europe or in Asia, notably in China, and just bringing it to, let's say, Africa or, or a country in Latin America. Eh? Um, it is about having the right product with the right specs, with the right, let's mm. say, um, quality, with the right price in the right environment. Yeah? So we don't need a, uh, I don't know, a super high tech electric motorcycle in, in, in African countries. What we need here is rather low tech, but sturdy, being affordable. That is important. Yeah? Now, if that product is there and if the product comes with the right policy environment, and with the right financing schemes, then this is sort of a no-brainer. Yeah? I mean, I can tell you that people here are much more open to new technologies. There's nobody who needs um, the bubbling sound of a Harley Davidson V2. Yeah? That is not that is not the that is not the most important thing. The most important thing mm. is to make a business, to make profit. And if you can show to the people that you can almost twice your daily, you can almost double your your, your daily income because you have much, so much less uh, uh, fuel costs, so much less uh, uh, maintenance costs. If that is the case, then you don't even need big campaigns, I would say, yeah? Because people are going for where the opportunities are lying, yeah? And I believe there are big opportunities in electric mm -hmm. mobility in low and middle income countries, yeah? And really financing mm -hmm. policy awareness that are the three pillars which um, we are actually working on with the partners uh, with you in, 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 in these countries. Thank you so much. I'm um, I'm looking at the time, and, and unfortunately, we don't have uh, space for more questions. But I take the opportunity to thank all our speakers, the keynotes, as well as the panelists, and of course, Shelko, my co-moderator here. Um, it has been very interesting, and as Shelko mentioned, really wonderful to have representatives from the different regions to get really worldwide perspectives. Um, so as I said earlier, this is the first webinar in a series of eight webinars. So please, uh, you know, watch out for the next uh, webinar that is coming in May. Uh, we look forward to uh, having your participation once again. But for now, thank you so much for the participation and also uh, a big, big applause to our speakers. Thank you.